At times, nature keeps its secrets mysteriously well hidden. From such secrecy stem possibilities to make the most exotic discoveries from the most unsuspecting places. Delicate forms of life, fighting for survival in perilous environments. Like on this dewy meadow in Leipzig's lowlands, the calm of this early summer morning is deceptive. Beneath the long grass, one finds a hive of activity, a microcosm in which multitudes of life exist together in the smallest of spaces and whose inhabitants have the most unlikely relationships. Underway, in search of food supplies, a group of ants winds its way across the open land. With their powerful jaws and communal strength, the ants can overcome prey much larger than themselves and then pull it back to their nest. This is exactly what this innocent-looking caterpillar is waiting for, to be caught and carried back to the nest. What looks like a capture by force is in truth a subtle ploy of the small caterpillar. A maneuver exacting a chemical exchange which will eventually cost the ants dear. They can never imagine what it wants from their nest. A gluttonous larvae, it is primarily interested in the security offered by the ants nest to help survive the winter. It won't be until next summer that it'll leave the nest again as a butterfly. Due to their unusual life cycle, large blue butterflies are in great peril. Their survival strategy, despite its advantages, is rife with dangers. Whatever the consequences, the maculinia, as it's known in Latin, is totally dependent on its host ants. The precarious nature of the blue's existence was seen at the end of the 70s in England. Their numbers began to plummet without respite. Even in specially constructed nature reserves, their numbers dwindled further. In some cases, one could argue that their decline was the direct result of the destruction of their natural habitat. For the greatest part, though, there was no explanation to be found. In 1979, it became evident that the large blue would become extinct, just like the dinosaurs of prehistoric times. The 50s and 60s and early 1970s, it was very severe, and um, it really got to a point where the last colony was left, and it was tiny, very, very small, about 250 adult butterflies, whereas, oh, 10 years previously, I guess there were about 30, 40 colonies of several thousand butterflies each. So it was a, a big question mark. Why was it that they were still dying? Even in England, where they were protected from collectors and the destruction of their natural habitat, the decline of the butterflies was a mystery to the scientists. Looking for explanations, the biologist Jeremy Thomas put the relationship between the butterflies and their host ants under the microscope. He came across a small but significant fact missing from contemporary knowledge. A detail about the ants which had, up until now, been overlooked. That bit of knowledge was that although um, it had long been understood that they go into red ant nests, Myrmica ants' nests, there were actually five different species of Myrmica on the same site that looked almost identical. Um, and although it was being carried into the nests of all the five species, it was really only surviving with one of those species. It was exactly this sort of ant, the Myrmica sabuleti, that was becoming more scarce. The reason? The Sabuleti ants can only survive on warm, unfertilized hillsides that are intensely grazed. Because of the reduction of such grazed land, the ants' numbers decline sharply. Without their essential host ants, the butterflies stood no chance. Their specialization became their downfall. 
By the time the researchers had pinpointed the cause, it was already too late for the last Machilinia. Their extinction in England sent shockwaves through the scientific world. Since 2002, biologists from all over Europe have been working on conservation for this wide world endangered species, a scientific project that is being coordinated by the Centre for Environmental Research, Leipzig Halle. We've got a very strong constellation of dependency factors that influence a wide range of consequences pertaining to the survival of the large blues. It's the complexity of the interaction which makes it such a fascinating system to study. Seen purely from a superficial point of view, there is little to differentiate the five different species of Machilinia found in Europe today. In fact, each of the five has its own individuality and has adapted differently to its surroundings. Critical factors are not only the ants, but also the vegetation. For example, the small Alcon blue prefers a damp ground without much oxygen. Vital is the presence of a particular plant, the marsh gentian. The female Alcon blue lays her eggs directly on the leaves of the buds. Tiny white pearls, which one week later hatch the little caterpillars. Sharing a similar distinctiveness are the scarce and the dusky large blue. These species are particular to the great burnet. It is only where this sort of burnet with its dark red petals grow in great numbers that serves a suitable habitat for this type of large blue. The lifespan of these butterflies is barely more than a week. For this reason, the male Maculinia has a particular hurry. In these few days of early summer, the main priority is to find a mate. The males patrol their territory relentlessly in an attempt to find a willing female. The butterflies consummate their matrimony between the end of July and the beginning of August. A short time after, the females lay their eggs. The scarce and the dusky large blue are also in this matter uncompromising. It is exclusively the great burnet that is suitable nutrition for the offspring. So the presence of one special plant is also a factor in the prosperity of the blues. This relationship between the flora and the butterfly is particularly interesting for the researchers, as it is only where there are plentiful nutritional plants that the butterfly's offspring has a chance. Like all butterflies, the large blues begin their life cycle as a modest caterpillar. For two to three weeks, it eats its way through petals around the stem of the bud before emerging to let itself fall to the ground. A risky game, because for the well-fed caterpillar lurk numerous perils. Among their known enemies are most forms of ants. But with the red ants, the larvae is investigated rather than attacked. Obviously, the caterpillar is capable of imitating the scent of ants, secreting a substance through tiny glands at the end of their body. David Nash from the University of Copenhagen researched this ploy. And since then, we've been able to do some chemical analysis and look particularly at a class of chemicals on the surface of these caterpillars called the hydrocarbons, surface hydrocarbons and compare those on the caterpillars with those on the ant's own brood. And there's essentially a perfect match. The same chem chemicals are found on the uh, surface of the caterpillar as on the ant's own brood, and that's probably what's fooling them into thinking they're picking up one of their own brood. Deceived by the caterpillar, the ants carry the foundling into their nest. Then, just like one of their own brood, the larva is cared for and fed. Despite this pampering, some nevertheless feed hungrily on the ant's brood. 
There are two groups of uh, Macrolinia butterflies. There are a group uh, which are predatory, which means the, the caterpillars eat the ant brood and only eat the ant brood. There's another group which have been called cuckoos because they uh, are fed by regurgitations from the ants in much the same way that a, a cuckoo bird is fed by um, the parents. However, only one type of red ants is deceived in this way by each of the Macalinia species. If the caterpillar has landed with the right sort, then their chances of survival are good. Ants nests can offer protection even through the hardest winters, right up until the larvae pupate later in the year. It is the start of an exhaustive transformation from caterpillar to chrysalis to butterfly that takes about three weeks. However, with the final metamorphosis, the camouflage is lost. The young butterfly must now quickly leave its pod to start its short and perilous life. Over the past years, a sighting of this unique insect has become a rare stroke of chance. All five of the European strains have been categorized as highly endangered. Today, few examples are found of a species whose means of existence are so highly specific. It's so sensitive to both climate change, to habitat change, to human activity, their populations can change within a few years from success to decline to increase. So they can tell us an awful lot about what's going on in other wildlife groups, particularly the insects, which form a large proportion of all the species on Earth. For conservationists, the occurrence of Macalinia butterflies is a clear indication that the biodiversity of any given area is very high. In short, that means that where the butterflies can prosper is an area also suitable for multitudinous other life forms. Together with the biologist Andreas Nunner, we investigate a Macalinia meadow in Ostalgau in Bavaria. On these secluded moors, just below the Alps, the butterflies have found an ideal environment. However, they are by no means the only species to feel at home here. Here we've got a typical inhabitant of this sort of fen meadow, a wart biter bush cricket. He has developed a very efficient chewing action. If I just hold this stem here and to the side, you'll see he'll go straight for it. The wart biters got their name because that was exactly the function they had. The local people used to put them on their skin because the wart biters' stomach juices actually dissolved warts and healed them. Already, the biologist has his next catch in sight. A dragonfly, a blue skimmer, easily recognizable by the rings on the end of its tail. They start at the front of the body and stretch out along the entire tail. They make it distinguishable from the smaller keel skimmers, which are mostly dark, nearly black in colouring. Suddenly, a strange knocking is heard. The call of a large marsh grasshopper. Here we have caught a male. He has a very distinctive call, which is almost like the sound of fingers snapping together. He's relatively colourful and can best be recognised by the reddish markings on the lower legs. Living ecosystems are very susceptible to fluctuation. Decreasing numbers of butterflies are an accurate first sign of change. For preservationists, it is therefore always useful to keep an eye on the large blooms. Few other species are as sensitive to the change in environment as the Macalinia. For this reason, the butterfly is used as a gauge of change. If we succeed in protecting these indicative species, we'll automatically preserve much of the other biodiversity. Farming in this respect plays a decisive role. When and how often a field is grazed or cut is of existential importance to the butterflies.
On this test site, south of Munich, the Macalinia researchers are experimenting with the frequency of mowing grass and the effect it has on the butterfly population. The grass under each tent is mown at varying intervals, and then the exact number of butterflies is recorded and the results correlated. The data is also of great interest for the software developers in the experiment. Based on their model, the scientists aim to provide the preservation authorities with an effective instrument to monitor and maintain an environment conducive to the well-being of the butterflies. As a result of the project, we can now present answers. We can now take exact measures to protect endangered butterflies in a specific area. For example, how to mow or graze the land, and how we can coordinate with the other areas to guarantee long-term survival. Finally, the European Union has introduced legislation, the so-called Habitats Directive to protect endangered species by law. In this respect, the investigation of the large blue butterflies has made a fundamental contribution. The results are not only significant for the blues and their dual dependency on ants and plants, the main aim of the Macalinia research is the assured protection of entire habitats that encompass numerous other animals and plants. When the butterflies prosper, they indicate a healthy environment filled with variety. When they die, it is an alarm signal for nature in jeopardy. Well, I think we're actually at a very crucial point in, in, in the history of butterflies in Europe because We've, the problems have never been as big as they have been now, all the losses, all the change that's out there. But equally, there's never been as good a time because we actually know why many of them as species are declining now. And we also are developing policies to actually reverse those declines. So uh, a lot of action is needed to conserve butterflies across Europe. There are few places in nature that are perfect for the exacting specifications of the large blues reliance. A butterfly that exemplifies the tightly woven dependency of living things. And for this reason, the Macalinia butterfly is well worthy of our continued attention.